What's up guys, Brian here with BPS Customs and welcome to my monthly build series for March 2017. This is gonna be my first full Ryzen build and my first AMD build of any kind in about a year. Last year I built the slightly less ultimate, ultimate budget system using an 8320 and the old AM3 platform. And I anticipate the performance of this build will be ever so slightly better than that one. I'm excited to put together a system using AMD's newest chip, so let's get started. Now, as this is my first Ryzen build, I made the decision to keep it all AMD from the get-go. This means you'll find no team green or team blue parts in here, as we're gonna keep it strictly red. Actually, we'll be keeping it orange, but we'll get to that in a minute. We're gonna be building in the excellent Corsair 400C that I reviewed in this video up here. I've done a client build in this case, but never a build specifically for the channel, and I'm excited to dig in here and see how things turn out. Now the brains of this build will be the real winner of the Ryzen 7 lineup, the 1700. While this chip might not provide 100% of the raw processing power of the 1800X, it gets close enough while costing significantly less. If you can overclock it, even better. Next up, we have a slew of parts provided for this build by Gigabyte, and I wanna give them a big thank you for that. First up is this brand new Aorus X370 Gaming 5. This board comes with all of the bells and whistles that the X370 chipset supports, including USB 3.1, an NVMe M.2 drive slot, dual LAN ports, improved audio, and ECC memory. It also looks the part with a simple, appealing white IO shroud and RGB fusion lighting. They also provided a two x eight gig kit of Kingston's new HyperX Predator DDR4 memory. This kit runs at 3200 megahertz. And given that one of the gripes people have with Ryzen so far is that memory speeds are not quite what they should be, it'll be interesting to see if we can get this kit running at its rated speed. It certainly looks aggressive with chunky heat spreaders and those are some of the heaviest dims I've ever held. Also in the big box I got from Gigabyte was the Corsair H100i CPU cooler. Now I haven't dug into this specific box just yet, but they did tell me that the AM4 mounting kit is inside. So let's keep our fingers crossed. It'll be great to get our CPU on water and see if we could squeeze out some additional clock speed from these notoriously mediocre overclockers. Rounding out our Gigabyte components for this build is the G1 gaming version of the Radeon RX 480. This version of the card features an increased core clock of 1290 megahertz, eight gigs of GDDR5, and an improved cooling solution with a metal backplate. It also has some orange accents on the shroud that inspired my color choices for this system. I'll do my best to configure the RGB Fusion software to match these kind of burnt orange cable extensions. They're not quite the shade of orange I was hoping for when I ordered them, but they should do just fine. For storage, we're gonna be using the blazing fast Patriot Ignite 960 gigabyte SSD. This drive has faster rated performance than the venerable Samsung 850 series, as well as a higher IOPS rating than the 850 Evo. We'll be powering everything with the new 700 watt Enermax Revolution Duo. This PSU is made specifically for cases with power supply shrouds, as it features a dual fan design for increased airflow in enclosed spaces. It's also 80 plus gold rated and should provide plenty of power for our needs. Unfortunately, it's not a modular design. And while I dig the sleeving on the cables themselves, the cable ends are all ketchup and mustardy, but that won't be an issue at all due to the extensions that we'll be using. So that's about everything. Let's get to building.
All right, guys, we are all done. Check it out. It is right back there. The orange color scheme actually came out looking a lot cooler than I thought it was going to. I was a little bit concerned with the shade of orange we had on those cables, but with the ability to match colors with the RGB Fusion software on the motherboard, as well as the RGB software associated with the Gigabyte graphics card, I was able to make everything look really uniform and really clean. And I think the colors match great. And I think that shade of orange actually looks really nice inside the white case with the black motherboard accents. I think it definitely has somewhat of a unique look. You don't see many orange systems and you see even less orange and white systems. So I'm definitely pleased with how everything came together. Now, as far as performance goes, there's definitely a few things I wanna talk about here. The first is that Ashes of the Singularity, as I'm sure you guys saw by the slides, would not complete. I couldn't get the uh, test to finish no matter what I did with this system. Uh, I don't know why that is. I I've had both this graphics card and this chip at separate times complete that benchmarking test, but I've never had them both together at the same time before this. And for some reason, something in the system was not playing nice with Ashes. I, I want to keep Ashes in my benchmarking suite simply because uh, it is a, an entire system stressor. It's very tough on the CPU and on the GPU. So I think that it's a good test to run. But at the same time, I have had these kinds of things happen before with Ashes and it seems to be very finicky about the hardware that it likes to play nice with. So I don't really know what happened there, but I, I attempted to run the benchmark a lot of different times using a lot of different settings. And I even just cranked everything back down to stock and that didn't make a difference. So what kind of overclocks was I able to achieve with the system? Well, the GPU, we had overclocked 60 megahertz. That's as far as I could reasonably push it. It was up to 1350 megahertz and I left the memory alone. I've had, extremely, let's call it mixed experiences while trying to overclock uh, the RX 470 and RX 480's memory. And I've found that if you're going to try for an overclock, clearly increasing the clock speed is gonna get you a much bigger boost in performance than if you were to just play with the memory. And we don't want to jeopardize our ability to get a, a decent overclock out of the core by playing with the memory speed. So I left the memory alone, so we were running these tests at 1350 megahertz with the memory at stock settings. Now as far as the CPU goes, this 1700, uh, this very chip, I've had overclocked to 4.0 4, uh, 4 gigahertz stable. Uh, and that was in an Asus Prime board when I was doing my Ryzen review. It, I didn't have any problems with it then, I was able to complete all my benchmarking tests and I deemed that overclock to be stable in that motherboard. Now every motherboard is different, the way it handles power delivery is different, and I was able to get this chip to four gigahertz in this board, and the system posted, and it booted, I was able to complete a couple of benchmarks, but after I started running Cinebench, the system would crash. And I don't ever wanna take some results at four gigahertz or X gigahertz if that is not deemed to be a stable overclock, even if the chip did complete those specific tests at that speed. You want to have a system that is stable all around before you start running your benchmarking suite. So I couldn't just cherry pick certain tests that were running at higher frequencies because those results are then skewed by definition. So I, what I did was I downclocked it to 3.9 gigahertz, booted the system back up, was able to complete all the tests without a problem, and I think that's what we're gonna call stable uh, for the 1700 in this board. What I was really happy with though, was the performance of the Corsair H110i CPU cooler. I had this running under load in Ida64, just stressing the system, seeing what kind of temperatures we had. And Ryzen Master was returning a report of 57, it was like between like 56 and 58 degrees Celsius. And it was it had um, it had uh, stabilized at that uh, that temperature. So the I clearly that is well within reason for an overclocked chip at a hundred percent load for any length of time. Uh, in fact, like my um, my previous rise in testing where I was testing the eighteen hundred X and the seventeen hundred using a Noctua air cooler, I was 
way above those temperatures. I was like almost in the, I was like in the low 70s, somewhere around there. And I know TJ Maxx on these chips is like, is supposed to be 75 degrees. So getting these on water is definitely um, something that I would recommend. And if I was building a system for long term, that would be my priority to get a, a really nice, at least an AIO cooler on here uh, and make sure that my chip stays nice and cool. Now, I wanna talk about the PC Mark score. The reason I run PC Mark is that it is one of the very few tests that is like an entire system benchmark that does normal tasks. It's supposed to replicate activity that a, a quote unquote normal user might uh, be doing with the computer. Word processing, web browsing, video conferencing, things of that nature. And I don't, let me put it this way, off the top of my head, I don't know of many programs that do that kind of a test. So that's the reason that I use the software, even though it doesn't really apply to a lot of my viewers specific needs, because a lot of a lot of you guys out there are gamers, uh, or your streamers or something along those lines. And this doesn't really talk to that aspect of how the system is going to perform. But at the same time, I think using PC Mark as part of a larger suite of tests is very informative. Now, the PC Mark score I got for this system is actually the absolute lowest score I've ever got on any of my monthly build systems. I don't have an explanation for that. I don't know exactly how the software calculates a score. And I can tell you that there's no way that this system should be scoring less than a $350 budget system like I did a couple months ago. So I am uh, from now on going to drop the PC Mark test from my suite of benchmarks, and I'm hopefully gonna try to find something to replace it. But as far as gaming benchmarks, I can tell you that this system outperformed any other RX 480 system that I have built since that card was released. Now, I am not talking about small margins here, anywhere between two and six frames per second higher than I've gotten with any other system that uses the RX 480 as its graphics processor. Now, I'm not sure if it has something to do with the coordination of things between the 1700 and the RX 480 that AMD makes both and, and they, they make sweet, sweet love to each other and, and your scores get a little higher. I'm not entirely sure about that. Or if this particular RX 480, you know, being a little bit higher clocked is gonna provide those additional frames. The thing is that the RX 480 that I used is not, it's not overclocked a whole lot compared to a reference card. And I was able to get a decent overclock on some of my reference cards when I was testing them with other systems. So the disparity in clock speed is not that great. But nevertheless, the scores that we were getting in 1080p gaming were well above 60 frames per second in every title that returned an actual score. And then in tests that incorporated specific CPU components like Asus RealBench and the physics test in Firestrike, this system just completely knocked it out of the park with those final scores, actually scoring higher on those tests than any other system that I put together for the monthly build series, including my entry-level X99 system, which used a 5820K. So just overall, I am certainly very pleased with the performance and the looks of this system. Now granted, this is not a budget system. The CPU that we use was, is $330, $340. The memory we use is $180, $190. And this, the SSD that we use is over $300. So yes, you could certainly achieve similar performance by using a little more budget-oriented parts, but going with the main components that we used here. Still though, I am extremely pleased with the way the system came out, the performance that we got, and obviously the way it looks. So what do you guys think of March's monthly build? Do you like the idea of going with an all AMD system at this time, or would you rather wait for Vega to have maybe a more powerful GPU paired with the new Ryzen chips? Let me know down below in the comments. Also, don't forget to get subscribed to the channel if you're not already, and hit that little like button down there if you like this video. As always guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.